All right, so what is the kind of curious science of humans at war? And basically what we're going with is 14 kind of interesting, like we'll say topics, because they're not necessarily just facts in and of themselves. There's a lot in each one of basically um, different aspects that people have to deal with when they go to war. And what this is, um, basically where this is coming from, I'll say, is the book called Grunt. The Curious Science of Humans at War by Mary Roach. Here's a cover for those of you who care. Um, there's that. Um, and honestly, this book was not what I was expecting it, in all honesty. So, who is Mary Roach? Just so we kind of know who we're talking about um, or who wrote it from their perspective. So she's an author of seven New York Times bestsellers, a journalist for like people like Nat Geo, Wired, the New York Times, the and Journal of Clinical Anatomy, and kind of specializes in science-based content, basically. She's a journalist, doesn't have a science degree, but she's been like pretty much doing specific like science-based articles for as far as I could tell ever. Um, so, there's that kind of just going through the book like it's got a lot of interesting things so like 14 chapters the first one basically is called second skin excuse me which is a lot about like the actual like clothing and stuff that we wear um for that sort of stuff specifically like service members in actual military uniforms and there's different kinds and so on so like um one of the things that they did was to test um some of the actual uniforms themselves is they would have they take them out to i think it's nevada i'm forgetting what it's called specifically but basically um they do like a series of nuclear blasts um and tests basically the uh the heat exposure and various aspects of different uniforms on they put them on pigs because it's very pigs are pretty similar to humans in the respects that they're testing um so there's that and they'd see like you know how the uniforms hold up um like from different materials things like that mostly with exposure time and miscellaneous things like um for example the auto ignition temperature for cotton is 700 degrees fahrenheit um, and it all depends on exposure time whether or not it actually ignites right so because things don't have to have fire to actually you know start burning um a lot of the times it's like how fire can actually start second um secondly um we'll go to one called boom box the second chapter which is basically about like um the automotive safety stuff mostly for driving over bombs and ieds and that sort of thing and so like she talks about like how they would up armor humvees um specifically like they would plate the vehicles with something called mexis um, the Mexis armor plates, which is basically work well against heavy machine gun fire, for example. And then they would do like slat armor, which is basically like in the armor, they would um, have little slats in the actual armor itself. And basically that would help like, uh, kind of control the blast from an RPG, but also like the tip would get pinched when it hit the armor because it gets stuck in the slat. And then, like, it would basically make it a dud from how the RPGs work them themselves. So, it says, like, it either prevents the explosion from happening or blocks the expulsion of nasty stuff. Um, very esoteric throughout the whole book. Uh, another one, so flanking the armor plates and basically replacing windows with Pope glass, which is two-inch thick transparent armor of basically the same type that they use for the Pope and that sort of thing. Um, also they would change like the undercarriage and that sort of thing too. So like she says, newer generations of vehicles have a V-shaped or double V-shaped chassis to deflect the energy unleashed in the, bla in the blast. And they also typically have higher clearance. So like they're higher above the ground and w instead of it being like flat on the bottom, so the blast just like hits the undercarriage and the whole thing goes up, um, it hits a point. So like it would hit the V and then deflect off, um, depending on how it hit it, right? Um, thirdly, we'll talk about noise, which is a lot about um, 
basically trying to fight hearing loss, which is a, a big thing in the military. So she talks about like most earplugs reduce noise by 30 decibels or so, or somewhere in the 30 range. Um, and every three decibel increase in a loud noise cuts in half the amount of time one can be exposed without risking hearing damage. It's like, that's a big thing that really, at least for us, like specifically, like you have to know, like, for example, like your specific plane, like what are the safety specs of everything, right? So like, where do you have to have, within what kind of, distance do you have to have hearing protection and for how long until you, for you to be in there and that sort of thing and there's other stuff too but that's part of the reason why and so also a soldier with an average hearing loss of 30 decibels may need a waiver to go back out and do his job depending on what the job is because he could be a danger in general if you can't hear um but that's also like that's ex so they need a waiver for 30 decibel hearing loss, but then that's exactly how much earplugs do. And so whenever you're making them wear earplugs, you're making them go into an environment where they're already at the same level that they would have to get like a medical waiver for to continue. Um, so it's like, what's the point sort of thing. And one of the things I talk about in the book is something called TCAPs which is tactical communication and protective system. So incoming noises are analyzed and quiet ones are amplified and loud ones reproduced more quietly, right? So it doesn't like cancel everything out um, and really dampen everything. It's more of like an inversion of the signals and sort of things. And there's, there's a similar stuff in like electronics and that sort of stuff. That's how a lot of noise dampening things work because um, you can really like degrade the overall signal if you just like completely try to cut out everything that's way too loud and so you can really like help invert above uh, once it, like if it's above like a certain threshold like it'll invert the part that's above that kind of volume threshold for lack of a better term and so it kind of helps like through like uh, deconstructive interference make it more tolerable to, like you'll still hear the noise but it's much quieter compared to what you actually want to hear um, but these TCAPs also incorporate like radio communications and they're ma mostly only used for like special ops for obvious reasons. I mean, these things are, especially with contractors and stuff, extremely expensive comparatively. Um, there's that. This topic actually has two chapters. Um, and especially since, especially for the dudes who listens a bit of an uncomfortable, uncomfortable one, especially how she describes a lot of the things. But uh, she talks about both genital reconstruction and transplants. And so I don't think I want to go too much in depth on this one, just because it can be a touchy subject. But basically, it's, it's a lot of the things you don't think about, like when you have like it was mostly for like survivors of IED blasts, right? Um, because they lose part of their genitals. Um, talks, she talks a little bit about the politics and like, you know, whether or not like, not just the VA, but like the military in general would help fix that kind of stuff. Um, and to what degree that's in there as well. And she also described like the, the processes in detail. And so, like, Fair Batum at one point talks about it uh, during a, uh, one of the, I don't remember if it's the reconstruction or transplant, regardless, doesn't matter. She talks, she um, compares it to basically splitting open a piece of kibasa, like the sausage and stuff like that. And that was a little, a little much. And then, like, squeezing it like a sponge. And it, never mind. Next topic. Uh, one of the cool things that I do remember from that part, though, is, like, when they, whenever they'd have to, like, uh, not regrow, but, like, replace part of their urethra, um, they could only really use, like, cheek tissue. Because if you try to use anything else, or, like, it's not used to that moist environment all the time. And so, I don't want to say rots, but it, like, kind of degrades quicker because it's not the, the right tissue to deal with that kind of moisture and, like, beating all the time. Whereas, like, 
your cheeks, the inside of your cheeks get that all the time. They're always wet from saliva and they're always um, getting bitten or something while you're eating. And so like they're used to that. And they, so they'd use your cheek tissue to basically replace your urethra. Um, there's that. Uh, she explains the process of genital transplants. Um, I'm not going to describe it. You can look that up on your own um, if you want. I did not watch videos. I don't care. I don't need to. Um, anyways, one of the funny stories that happened um, with this is basically the first uh, kind of genital transplant was actually done in China in 2006. Um, and basically, the uh, there was additional trauma after they screwed it up because the new one to take a quote, the new one regretfully had to be cut off after two weeks. It's not that the man's body didn't reject it, but his wife did. There were no further details supplied um, other than there was a severe psychological problem beyond our and our patient's imagination. Basically, they mentioned swelling and necrotic tissue. Basically, what had happened was... <laughs> Um, the doctors didn't um, actually connect the right arteries. And so um, basically the end, the tissue just died because it wasn't ever getting any blood because they didn't actually fill up or connect the arteries on both sides because there's like two spongy areas of tissue that's what grows. And they, um, they forgot to hook up those arteries or didn't do them correctly, and so his tip just died, which is rough for one. Um, next uh, one we'll talk about since the six, if you're keeping track. So some of the suits that they used to train the Navy corpsmen and other like combat medics too, and they talked about that. Um, basically like, kind of like fake organs, but like have, uh, they have like a pump hidden somewhere where they could like, ch um, change and control um the blood flow that's coming out of like certain areas of them so like they'll pretend that and they'll use like amputees too like they'll have an amputee who's missing like half the below his or above his knee on the left leg or whatever and they'll have him pretend to be a um a casualty for that kind of injury again um but it's fake this time and they have like uh tube set up so you could change how blood it is, how, how much blood comes out, that sort of thing. Um, and then she describes in process, um, wow. She describes in detail the process and kind of some of the training that they deal with in that respect. There's that. Uh, one of the big ones I'll say is about sweat that I will note. on um, kind of like exactly like what is sweating? Cause I didn't know this kind of stuff. And so like, basically like, she describes earlier she kind of thought of like sweating as like kind of like a dip your body's like dipping in the lake it just like gets water out to help cool you down which isn't the whole process right so like with what she's saying on what it actually is so sweat actually comes from the plasma in your blood um so basically it cools by evaporation. So like all the blood rises to your skins and gets into like the capillaries and that sort of thing. Part of the reason also I like you get very vascular um, if you're overheated um, to help like offload a lot of that heat. Um, so specifically when you start to overheat, vessels in your skin dilate, encouraging blood to migrate there. From the capillaries of the skin, the hot plasma is offloaded through sweat glands about 2.4 million or so onto the surface of the body to evaporate. Evaporation carries heat away from the body in the form of water vapor, right? Basically, um, in extreme heat, humans can sweat as much as two kilograms an hour over a few hours and roughly like 10 kilograms loss of sweat over the course of a day is not rare for workers in overheated factories and active soldiers stationed in the tropics. Right, so that's like what 25 pounds, obviously roughly, um, is 2.2 kilograms, so around 10, whatever. Um, it's a lot of sweat. So there's that, um, but that also makes sense of why like overeating and stuff, um, and like passing out. She uses the technical terms: uh, heat exhaustion and heat syncope. 
which is feigning, I guess. So basically like the whole point of sweating and everything is the blood's rushing to your skin and going out through that way. Um, but if you're being very physically active outdoors, like a soldier in the tropics, then like your, your muscles need that blood too. And so it's a battle between the two. Um, so basically with blood flowing out to the skin for cooling purposes, and at the same time into the muscles to deliver oxygen to fuel the body's toil, it becomes hard to maintain the blood pressure needed to pump blood up to the brain. Excuse me. And without enough oxygen carrying blood into your brain, you pass out. This is kind of why, like, um, like if you're having, like, you're really working hard at, like, running or whatever, um, maybe you're not used to it, um, you don't want to stop running when, like, you're extremely tired. You want to keep moving because that's when you pass out, right? It's because, like, the blood, you're, you moving your legs even down to, like, just walking or whatever, like, just don't stop, um, is what's helping pump the blood up to your brain. And so if you just stop, all the blood can like pull to your legs because that's where it's needed. Yes, but then it pulls everything down from your brain and then you pass out. Um, and that's also like, it's self-reinforcing in a way because like you hit the ground and now you're level and the blood can help go back to your brain and so on. It's supposed to help, but it can hurt. Um, for number eight, she talks about diarrhea, which I thought was interesting, at least with like what it is, because I learned stuff about that too. Like typic, like what is a uh, traveler's diarrhea? So it's an, it's another catch-all term. Most of it, at least 80% is bacterial with five to 10% viral, which typically includes vomiting as well. Um, and miscellaneous percentage of prozoa, like amoeba or Gyridia, we'll say. <laughs> um, all of it is caused by contaminated food or water, right? But the biggest thing on this one is more like what exactly is going on with it too. Because a lot of people um, think, and she talks about experiences of with her talking to special warfare um, or special ops mostly on what they... Um, on their experiences with it and how they think about it because they're in those areas where they're having to deal with those kind of foods all the time um but basically people think that you know it's it's watery and everything in your body's trying to flush it out which isn't necessarily the case it's like the bacteria or whatever's giving you the dysentery is like attaching itself to your stomach wall basically um We'll say so the names of the bacteria that I probably can't pronounce uh, Shigella and Campylobacter. Uh, so, two common causes of bacterial dysentery wield a toxin delivering secretion apparatus or a um, hypodermic cum bayonet that injects toxins into cells in the intestinal lining killing them and then causing the fluid to spill out and that's part of the watery stuff so there's that and then like um they like attach themselves in the lining and basically your large bowel is one of its primary duties is the absorber of water and so like you're not absorbing the water anymore and so it stays in that tract and that's why it's so watery um so instead of the food waste getting drier and more solid as it moves through your gastrointestinal tract, it stays liquid the whole way because that's why it's dry. Um, so there's that sort of thing. Um, fun, fun facts, I guess. Uh, nine is about maggots, basically like the science of using maggots in medicine and preventing like uh, major infections. So like you can actually make maggots sterile and you can introduce them into a wound and they'll eat only the um, the dead tissue for and uh, these are ex like extremely expensive surprisingly mostly because of the amount of care that has to go to it you know like making sure it's like they don't try to turn into flies and that sort of thing in that part and basically you have a lot of nurses that actually have to know what they're doing in that respect because that's not something I'd assume they train a lot of the times um, but yeah, but basically, like, 
it's a pain to deal with. It's cool, but like apparently like the magus can literally like help increase you, how fast, I guess how fast you heal because you're not dealing with, you're not also dealing with infections, right? Um, finally, or not finally, um, anyways, number 10, stink bombs. So basically I'm trying to kind of go a little bit quicker. So stink bombs talks about like diff basically different smells that they would use and they'd like test people on like how these smells or what they thought of them. Basically blind, blind testing where they didn't know what it was. Things like vomit, burned flesh, hair, whatever. Um, when they would give these to people, uh, a non-zero amount would say like it, it smelled like it was edible. It smelled good or like they would wear it as like a perfume at some point. And like the only ones that didn't get that reaction in a, like a non-zero percentage was like uh, the smell of cadavers, so dead people, or um, basically field latrines was another one. So there's that. Um, also talks about shark repellent. Um, basically like, you know, a lot with the Navy um, going out in the ocean and and stuffs as they do. Um, and also aviators going down in a way and basically trying to like combat, like keep sharks away. And pretty much they did a whole bunch of stuff trying to figure out what the hell they could do in this sort of thing. Found that not a lot of it was very viable um, in general, but they did find out, you know, like dead shark is the best shark repellent, which, and then basically instead of just like using that kind of stuff, that scent or whatever to just do it, they wanted to find the specific parts that repelled the shark within that compound or whatever, not a compound, but that substance in a way. Um, and that's when you get into the bureaucracy and why things didn't work. But anyways, um, they also did a review to where like, they don't really need to do this anyway. Um, in a review of 2,500 aviators accounts of survival at sea during World War II, there were just 38 shark sightings and only 12 which resulted in injuries or death. So there's that. She also talks about escaping from down submarines because that's concerning when you're at the bottom of the ocean. Um, talks about that process, um, also sleep deprivation, that was also a study that, or something she was studying on submarines mostly, like the nuclear subs, like the USS Tennessee, um, where they, they found basically the average sleep time is four hours, just, they have a lot of stuff they have to do, and always be like vigilant in a way, and so, there's that sort of thing. And then finally, she talks about autopsies, um, basic called feedback from the fallen, basically like how they do the autopsy process, um, what they're looking for, and that sort of thing. Um, so there's that. Those are the 14 like different kind of topics in a way. So why you should read this book? And one, it's pretty short. It's not that bad. Um, pretty interesting as well. I obviously like try to go pretty quickly, like superficially over everything. So like you kind of know what in general is in there and you can look specifically if you wish. So there's that. Um, so this book explains the science of some of the things basically and that, that we used to like fix and like some of the most common like actual like adversaries that um, service members have to deal with. Um, where most of the stories come in like um, you're in the field and you have nowhere to go and sometimes you just need to do number two where you're at and doesn't matter if that's a trench or not sort of thing um that's one of the things but also like the heat exhaustion talks about like the study of that and like how you can help and some of the things we do that i'm also guilty of doing um that make like heat exhaustion and that's you make you more susceptible to that sort of things like supplements we take um especially like if you're really big into working out that sort of stuff um for example things like that um really helps you kind of understand things about like dealing with extremes in a way like extreme heat extreme exhaustion 
sleep deprivation, that sort of thing. So you kind of understand more of the science behind that, which does help when you're actually dealing with it. It kind of makes you more aware um, at times when like you can only sleep for like maybe 20, 30 minutes at a time, maybe an entire night or so. And like, so you kind of, you're aware in the back of your head. It, it's easier to kind of help control your behavior when you're, when you're actually going through that. Um, at least minutely. So there's that. Also, there were there are nine pages of bibliography, um, and she also talks to the people who like are actually making the gear, making these things, and also the people who are using them, which I thought was big. So it's like it's not just like okay, here's the science stuff of it, cool. It's like this is the the private who's actually using this on a daily basis. You know, how is it working for them? There's a bit of that in there too. So I actually, I was quite surprised with the book. Um, I didn't mean for this to be one of the longer videos, but I'm not surprised because I kind of nerded out a bit, I'm not gonna lie. So there's that. Might look into more specifics later. And if you guys are interested, do videos on those as well. Um, she has other books, but I haven't. They're kind of similar. They're all very, We'll say marketing focused, um, where it's like a single word title and then very similar to what this one is, just different topics. Um, all seem to be kind of science based in a way, which is cool. But, anyways, I'm gonna leave this one here. If you have any other suggestions on similar books to read or topics or something to elaborate on or whatever, I mean, that's what comment sections are for. But, anyways, I'm gonna leave this one here and with that. See you up there on the next one.